Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler is very excited to present today's program. It's part of our summer digital programs titled World Arts, 
local lives. This is the second of the Fowler's Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible curatorial explorations of charismatic objects from around the world in our permanent collection. We're so pleased that you've joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind during your lunch break. Today, we will be joined by Senior Curator of Southeast Asia and Pacific Arts at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, Joanna Barkman, to take a closer look at a pair of ancestor figures created by an unknown sculptor on a Toro Island, Timor-Leste, in the early to mid 20th century and known in the Tetan language as Itara. We'll also get to see clips from original short video produced by Joanna showing in a Turin master sculptor, Antonio Suarez, creating a pair of Itara. First, a little bit about Joanna. Joanna's research interests relate to the island of Timor, both West Timor, Indonesia, and the independent nation of Timor-Leste. She curated an, an exhibition, Sculptures of a Toro Island at Charles Darwin University Art Gallery in 2017, and authored the accompanying publication, which was republished trilingually in 2019. She also co-curated Textiles of Timor, Island in the Woven Sea at the Fowler Museum in 2014, and a major exhibition about the arts of Timor-Leste presented by the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory which featured the National Collection of Timor-Leste in 20, 2009. Her current exhibition, Aboriginal Screen Printed Textiles from Australia's Top End, will be presented at the Fowler Museum at UCLA in 2021 and will be accompanied by an eponymous publication. If you have any questions during this program, I encourage you to use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Joanna will answer any questions at the end of the program. All right, that's enough from me. Joanna, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction, Bianca, and greetings to everyone uh, on this uh, fine Monday. Um, I'm really pleased today to be able to talk about a pair of Itara figurines from the Fowler's collection that were gifted in uh, 1981 by the Rogers Family Foundation. And I'm going to quickly jump over to my um, PowerPoint now and um, begin a little presentation. So let's see how we go. Um, the uh, Sculptures of Ata'uro Island are really quite distinctive, as is the island itself. And I thought I'd begin by showing um, an image of the island just to orientate us a little bit to the region. Um, Ata'uro is an island of about 25 kilometres long, nine kilometres wide, and it sits across from the mainland of Timor. Uh, actually, this photo is taken on a boat um, sailing across from the, island, uh, the city of Dili, which is the capital of East Timor, um, which was a former Portuguese colony for over 400 years uh, and gained independence uh, after Indonesian occupation for 25 years or so um, in 2000. So sailing from Dili, we um, traverse a very deep body of water known as the Wetar Strait. It's over 3,500 metres deep, it's very dangerous. And subsequently, there's a lot of uh, mythology about this body of water, uh, the Wetar Strait. Um, as we go across in that instance, there were beautiful dolphins swimming, and there's a lot of mythology uh, that relates to the creatures that inhabit the sea, to mermaids, to mermen, and these are often depicted in quite contemporary sculptures that are produced um, at this time from the island of Ataburo. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to let you know that your screen has not shared, so if there's a presentation element, we're not seeing it. Oh, I'm so sorry. No just... Bear with me. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll just begin again briefly, just so you can see those. Can you see that now? Yes, you can see it. There you go, perfect. If you want to go with the presentation, we'll pretty. Okay. Um, some of the 
the aquatic life, dolphins as we approach the island. Um, and we can see here the use of, uh, so many of the Aturans are, um, are seafaring people. They fish as for their livelihoods using very outrigger um, uh, canoes, which are made uh, carved from tree trucks. Uh, furthermore, they, they use fishing nets to, um, to retrieve fish from the ocean, again, for their subsistence. And also people are deep sea fishers. So um, here we see um, a woman, uh, Dina Martinez, um, deep sea fishing, spear fishing, wearing wooden goggles, also carved on the island. Um, so just to show again, so it's here is East Timor, uh, Atuuro is here, this very small orange island, and it forms part of the um, Banda Arc, the outer arc of the um, Lesser Sunda Islands, and it's um, um, uh, Alor is the island to its left and Weta is the island to its right, both of which remain parts of Indonesia. And it's believed that this, these islands here were all once one island and that a large eel, uh, its tail uh, flapped and broke the islands into um, many smaller islands. So here we can see Makile, which is one of the central villages for uh, wood carving and sculpture, and also Makadede, further inland, is the other area where sculptures are produced on Atauro Island. And the final thing to say about the island is that it has been a penal colony. Um, it was used by the Portuguese to send dissidents uh, for over 100 years. And so people from different colonies of Portugal, including Mozambique, um, um, and go Cape okay. uh, sculpture tradition and has become an amalgam of both this wider region of Alor and Weta, as well as and Timor, as well as these influences from uh, from parts of Africa. We can see the island is also incredibly dry um, and a very harsh environment on which to survive. So here are our sculptures uh, that we're um, um, looking at today, the Itara figurines. Uh, they're a pair of sculptures. Uh, what really distinguishes the sculptures of Atauro is that they're depicted as standing, as freestanding figures. Um, the region of Weta, Alor, the Lesser Sunda Island, sculptures from these, this region are generally depicted as hunched figurines with the bent knees, the elbows re bent resting on the knees with the chin resting on the hands, that very classic hunched style. Whereas on Atauro, the sculptures of figurines of ancestors are always depicted as standing forms. And this is a very unique aspect to the sculpture of Atauro in relation to the broader region. We see that they're also generally very elongated, and this is um, a, a style that's become more pronounced over time. Uh, we see that, so the limbs um, are generally um, not uh, accurate in terms of proportion, they're generally longer. We see the facial, the very extended facial features, the elongated nose. Um, also classically, uh, classic features include the overarching eyebrow, the protruding eyeballs, this very, um, Kurt, there's a very distinctive style for depicting the ears. Uh, and uh, we know that this is, um, and, and in this case, the man wears a hat, a sapeo, which are worn out farming in the heat of the day. And the woman, um, who's more diminutive, actually wears a head bun. She would have, a, she has a knot at the back of her head, although we can't see that. Other features to comment upon is that often the figurines are depicted with, with um, nipples, uh, with navels, with their genitalia, and also in this instance with a um, sometimes featuring body adornment. Sometimes you'll see earrings uh, that the women wear, traditionally that are made out of tortoise shell. And in this instance, we see the man is wearing um, a necklace, uh, which is a type of um, make is traditionally known as Morten, and it's made out of uh, red stones. And these Morten are used um, as a symbol of wealth and are used in marriage alliance and, and as bride wealth exchange. So what we also see here is the use of the hirik, uh, the cord that's been twined together. It's um, made from palm fibers from, from boracius, and it's, um, 
use both practically to join the, uh, the figurines together, the male and the female, and to maintain that sort of um, unified balance of the, of the two opposing elements. It's also used to hang the sculptures. So these were generally, this pair of figurines were generally created um, after um, family members had passed away, and then they would be stored in the ceremonial house. Uh, they'd be hung from rafters, and they would be fed uh, in the traditional style of the uh, Ata'urans, generally there'd be a fireplace um, with stones at the base of the, um, on the floor of the ceremonial house where rice and fish would be prepared. And the smoke of this fire would emanate upwards, which served to uh, add to the patina and darken the sculptures. It also served to preserve them. So the smoke is a great um, repellent of insects. And so um, due to smoke, we see the darkness of the um, sculptures. We see that they've been preserved. And indeed, many textiles were also preserved um, in ceremonial houses in Timor because of this use of smoke from the fires to feed the ancestors. So this feeding of ancestors um, is to request fecundity of the clan, um, good harvests and safe passage. These sculptures also may have rarely occasionally been taken out of the ceremonial house uh, and placed um, at the doorstep of the, um, of the threshold, if you want, of the uh, ceremonial house, particularly in times of imbalance or times of theft or famine, and they would be placed on the doorstep and really put, put, uh, put out in public to show people that they were being observed, that the ancestors were with them, and to give further um, authority, if you want, or a sense of protection um, or um, uh, um, or observance over events that were taking taken place. So they serve the purpose of maintaining balance within the clan. They also serve the greater purpose of retaining balance metaphorically by the unification of the male and the female, the left and the right, the, um, the sky and the night. And these concepts of duality permeate uh, the traditional cultures of the people of Atuoro. Uh, just to make the comment here um, briefly that the um, around the groin area we see a different um, uh, colour of cloth so the patina is not as dark. Uh, uh, just to comment this these sculptures are made from a type of rosewood that grows on the island but indeed um, in the late 1800s um, not only with Portuguese sending uh, uh, convicts to Ata'uro, but also the Protestant church, the Calvinistic mission had arrived on nearby Kisar, and uh, the introduction of cloth was um, used on sculptures. And so traditionally men would have worn a loin cloth on Ata'uro, women wore, wore a skirt cloth. And so um, made of, um, from fiber, woven on a loom, but using uh, natural fibers, not cotton, but um, local um, palm fibers. And so they uh, incorporated these garments, if you want, into the sculptures as a form of modesty. And until today, we see this tradition uh, continuing to incorporate uh, cloth and over time it's become printed cloth that's accessed from Java. So just by way of comparison uh, to, uh, to these beautiful, this beautiful pair of sculptures in the Fowler collection, uh, I wanted to show you this pair of sculptures again to just emphasize this very elongated form. You can see here though, shoulder we see here fish on the um, in the fowler, and this is a distinguishing feature. There's really two styles of sculpture that emanate from Atuuro. Here again, we see this fo forward folding uh, or bending uh, shoulder um, and a slightly rounder face, and this is considered to be a style that's that's more um, directly a result of the Wetteries uh, influence. Whereas the more angular or the straighter version, such as these ones, which are more reminiscent of the pair at the Fowler, with this uh, this shoulder, shoulder and again we see this elongated form really being emphasized in this instance. Here we see the children attached, the woman holding two children, the man holding one child, representative of fecundity and um, of both the feminine and masculine form. Uh, interestingly we see the use of the cloth here as well. Um, 
Well, at this point, I just wanted to, by way of introducing the video, um, I wanted to make the point that um, in the 70s, a lot of this sculptural tradition really um, dissipated on the island of Atuuro. Uh, the, the role of Christianity was much stronger. Many traditional practices, um, um, sculptures and other forms of art. Uh, in some instances, sculptures were stored, though, squirreled away in, in caves on the island, later to be, um, to be opened up. And with uh, independence, indeed, people started selling uh, ancestral sculptures um, in 2000. Uh, but prior to that, in the 70s, there had been a big wave of collecting uh, that saw Atuuro sculptures really for the first time come onto the international art market. So since 2000, there's been a real resurgence uh, in the sculptural practice, uh, partly because this was a way for people to earn money uh, during very difficult times following the war in East Timor. And we see the production of contemporary production of sculptures, both as um, tourist souvenirs with these very small ones we can see on the left here uh, on the, um, the stone, on the concrete wall, and then uh, with larger pieces that are being produced by young sculptors that um, that come in, that sail across from Atuuro and reside on the beach at Dili. Um, and here we see Antonio Suarez, one of the most um, prolific sculptors again in, uh, in, in Dili. Uh, and he, um, he, he rows his wares across the wet ass strait into Dili where he sells them. And so by way of introduction, I'd now like to hand over to Jean for us to look at a short film that, um, that um, we made a few years back of Antonio creating a small um, sculpture uh, for, uh, for sale uh, on the Esplanade at Dili. So at that point, over to you, Jean.
So I just wanted to make a couple of comments and show this, this is a more contemporary um, work that uh, Antonia Suarez created. Uh, we can see from the video, uh, the sculptors work with very simple um, um, hand tools um, over time, not always, but so often uh, the, the scale, the size of the works have become more diminutive. But this is a work that he created um, uh, several years ago, and we see the um, addition of this very um, tiered hat, uh, which is a symbol of the aristocrat um, in Timor, and particularly on Atuuro. And this um, is a style, and we begin to see a, a much more naturalistic sort of depiction of the facial features, and indeed more um, emphasis of, I guess, more um, figurative um, uh, physical elements. Um, so that's an interesting piece um, that shows, I guess, that there's an innovation happening in terms of the way in which the sculptors are working uh, in the current era. And then I wanted to end just showing this piece, um, which I think are a really elegant um, pair of sculptures, again, from Atuuro, but we also get a real sense of some of the way in which the sculptors are really extending the form and developing the work see instances and uh, these contemporarily um, darkened by applying um, soot and um, that's created from burning coconut husk. And again, we see the, the incorporation of these textiles. So we see really um, a style of sculptures that's really continuing, that's developing, that's um, in transition uh, in the 21st century. And I think it's really quite a testimony to the, to this, the sculptors of Atuuro that they've managed to hold on to this, um, this tradition uh, through the vicissitudes of time. And partly that is because they come from this very remote and isolated island um, on East Timor. So at this point, I'm going to um, just um, end the actual PowerPoint and um, we might just um, return and see if there are any um, looking into the, the, um, the box here. And I can see there's one that's asking about the smoke that helped preserve the wood sculptures and textiles. And what is the principle that smoke helps to preserve textiles? And was there damage or side effects? So often, the, for the sculptures, no, there was no side effects. In fact, the, um, as I mentioned, the smoke added to the patina and helped to darken the sculptures over time as the wood aged. And the smoke actually is a repellent to insects uh, that may uh, infest the wood. Um, also with the textiles that were stored in ceremonial houses in this manner, more often than not, they're um, contained within other textiles. So they're often wrapped with an outer layer of textile if it's a ceremonial or sacred textile. And then often they're stored in uh, a fibre basket. And again, this offers a layer of protection from the smoke. And again, the smoke though kills the insects. So in the tropics where there's an amount of humidity, uh, the other thing that the smoke does is it prevents um, mould. Uh, so in the wet season, when the humidity is very high, the mould growing on be it wood surfaces or within the textiles, is really reduced because of the use of that smoke. So although it wasn't necessarily the, the reason why the smoke was, um, or the fire was used in the first place, it was definitely a real benefit to the preservation of these objects. And we know this because some textiles have been radiocarbon dated from Timor, having been found in ceremonial houses, having um, existed for over 400 years. So that's pretty exceptional in such a humid uh, and tropical climate. Uh, there's another uh, uh, question here, which is about the relationship between textile art and the sculptures. Uh, that's really interesting. I think the only thing is the um, uh, uh, I think that so on Ata Uro, there is not really a, a fire. Oh, well, the weaving tradition. There is not a tradition of weaving cotton. There is a tradition of weaving fibres. Uh, the Kofia Utan fibre is what has been used. It's woven on a type of loom um, 
where, uh, and it's really like, a, I guess, in one of a better form, it's, it could be called, considered a grass skirt. It's woven as, a, sarong, as a, a rectangular shape with a fringe at either end and wrapped around um, the lower part of the torso. Um, the wrap in Herrick um, is no, was no longer, well, in 2005 or six, uh, there were only two women that still had the knowledge to make the Rupp in Herrick because its use as a tyre had really disappeared on the island. People were wearing um, printed um, cloth generally from Indonesia. Uh, however, at that time, there was the, um, these women were commissioned to recreate the Rupp in Herrick, uh, which entered the collection of uh, the Alola Foundation, which have a textile collection. And also another piece was commissioned by the Timor Aid Collection. And so two organisations in East Timor that document uh, textiles and work with weavers. And so from the basis of commissioning these two works, the women of Atauro have retrieved, if you want, this skill and have maintained it and now continue to weave in this uh, form, but more generally rather than as attire, but more so as um, uh, table runners and others um, and the fibers used um, yeah in that form more, more so as table runners and even as being constructed into handbags in the 21st century um, so I think that's an interesting um, interesting development in the way in which the um, the, the fibers have ew, the weaving has been revived to some degree but I don't think there is any direct relationship between the textiles of that region um, and the, um, the sculptures. Uh, so I think that's, there's a, a, maybe a, a couple of other questions, but I'm getting the, um, the, um, uh, the uh, okay, there's one more, which I'll quickly answer. How much do you think the art is influenced by adhering to tra tradition versus catering to demand from buyers from outside the area? Uh, I actually think uh, that's an interesting, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex question to answer very briefly, but I think that actually it's largely, uh, well, it's a combination of those two factors. I certainly do think that there is, um, there are elements of the tradition that are very much um, uh, alive in the style and form of sculptures that are being created in the 21st century. I also see that there's innovation based on tradition. And then there are definitely some influences that external influences. I think those sculptors are responsive to external influence to see how they can actually adapt and develop their skills and their product. But um, they're not really made, the sculptures are no longer made for um, ceremonial use on the island. However, there are two ancestor figures uh, in a plateau at the very top of the mountain, Manakoko on uh, Atauro Island that, content, that were most recently replaced in 2005. So that does indicate that there is still some sort of ceremonial significance attributed to sculptures uh, on the island, but these are placed outdoors, as I said, on the plateau. So I think at this point, um, I will, um, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I wouldn't think that it's a sad situation on Atauro. I actually think that it's a really unique situation where we see the survival of this uh, art form and its continued development. Um, tradition, nothing is static, things are always changing. And so I think it's really interesting to see that this has continued to be um, a source of pride, a form of asserting identity, and also importantly, a form of livelihood for the sculptors of Atauro in the 21st century. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Bianca. Thank you so much, Joanna, for waking up at 4.30 a.m. Australian time to host this lunch and learn with us. Really, really fascinating stuff that you shared with us to offer food for thought this Monday. Thank you. To everyone else, this program has been recorded. It will be available on our Instagram and on our website for you to revisit and share. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you'll join us on Thursday for our next program. You can find details on the closing title card. Have a good week.